The Prophet Joseph Smith once said to his uh, colleague, if you live into the next century, you will see evidence for the Book of Mormon come forth in droves. The story of the epic journey of Lehi and Sariah begins in this place in Jerusalem. The time of Lehi, um, the original city of Jerusalem, which was just one hill surrounded by a wall that David and Solomon built. It's a city Lehi could have walked the streets and seen lots of people that he knew every day. They had the temple as the focal point where they could go and, and offer sacrifices and join in prayers. This pool was here in the days of Lehi and Sariah. It was an essential source of water into the city. One of Sariah's tasks would have been to um, draw the water every day to bring to the family. And there's one spring in Jerusalem, the Gihon Spring, and it, the water's tunneled from the Gihon Spring to the Pool of Siloam. He and Sariah would have known this place. They'd have visited it. It might have also been a place where she would have encountered people talking about the things her husband was doing and saying. Lehi's family was a prosperous family in several ways. They had flocks and herds. They had a home in Jerusalem. They had what they call the land of their inheritance, designated land that was theirs. And they had wealth, including silver and gold and precious things. Lehi found out not long after the Book of Mormon opens that he was of the tribe of Manasseh. Now Manasseh was a tribe that belonged originally to the Northern Kingdom, which of course had been carried off a century or so before the opening of the Book of Mormon. So it seems that, that Lehi and his family are to a certain extent outsiders and that Laban was probably a kinsman of Lehi. That's why he had the records, uh, specifically the records of Joseph. And they were uh, children of Joseph and the Josephite record that was being kept on the brass plates was in the possession of Laban. Having them would, of course, be a great status symbol as the leader of the clan or something like that. He is able to command 50 soldiers within the walls of the city of Jerusalem, which means that he is a military officer and a very high-ranking official. Jerusalem was going through a really difficult period at the time of Lehi. Although Jerusalem, in terms of size, political power and military strength was, was not too big, in terms of its significance in international affairs, it was quite an important city. The kingdom of Judah was caught politically between not just two empires, but really three, the Egyptians uh, to the southwest, and then the Babylonian empire, which was rising, the Assyrian empire, which was dying. And so there were parties and factions in Jerusalem saying, well, the safety of, of Judah would be most assured if they threw in their lot with the Egyptians, or on the other hand, that they should forget about the Egyptians, go with the Babylonians. Uh, some felt that they ought maybe to stick with the Assyrians. The, the fundamental political problem of Judea is that of a small country wedged between major superpowers who are at war with one another, and that this country is the battleground. So you had the factions within the city of Jerusalem jockeying for position. Jerusalem was caught in the middle, and it was very difficult for them to know where their alliances should uh, be placed. So it's a very unstable, very chaotic, and very uncertain situation. Judah's under threat, and they know it. They just don't know which way to react. And if they don't make the right decision, chances are they're going to be destroyed. And of course, they made the wrong decision, and they were destroyed. The time of Lehi, we have several prophets that are all operating in the same time period. Among those who were Lehi's contemporaries were Zephaniah, Nahum, Habakkuk, and of course the most famous, Jeremiah. There is reason to believe that Lehi may have known Jeremiah personally. All of his ministry was spent in the city, and that's where Lehi's early ministry was spent as well. Included in the number of contemporary prophets, were the youths who once lived here and moved to Babylon when the Babylonians took captives. They included Daniel and Ezekiel, both of whom had grown up here in their earliest years. 
but lived their adult lives far from here in Babylonia. I like to think that the young Daniel and the young Ezekiel would have known Nephi. The city of Jerusalem is a fairly small place. We estimate about 25,000 people. The picture that we get of Jerusalem society on the eve of the destruction of Judah is, is one of idolatry. That's one of the most common threads in Jeremiah, that people are worshiping any number of other things besides the one true God of, of uh, Israel. There were several theological uh, changes that were going on in Lehi's day. One of them, I think, was a tendency uh, in some people's minds to want to elevate law above prophecy and the following of the Spirit. We see Jeremiah also hoping that there will be a new covenant written in the hearts of the people. They were performing the outward performances of the law. They were doing their sacrifices. They were keeping the Sabbath day, doing all the things that were easily seen. There's immorality, a great deal of immorality that's going on there. And Jeremiah and Lehi both seem to fulminate against that, that, that these people are not living the commandments that they were given. They just didn't keep the law of Moses as they had it at all. There's a great deal about uh, social injustice in Judah, that you had an arrogant ruling class um, linked with Egypt in a lot of ways. In this sense, Lehi is a very interesting figure because he has those links with Egypt. It's clear that he does. His family comes from that kind of upper crust background. He's got money. He's got the proper education. But unlike other people of his social class, he rejects the reliance on Egypt. And that's what's really striking. They were ignoring the widows and the orphans. Um, they were downtrodding the poor. They weren't sharing of their substance. They're focused on their riches and forgetting God, not living the spirit of the law that was given to them. Lehi's prophecies consisted of two main thrusts. One had to do with the destruction of the city if people did not repent. The other, of course, had to do with the Messiah. Both parts of his message made people angry. Lehi would be saying, in effect, it's hopeless. Um, the Lord is not going to intervene on your behalf. You have sinned. If you repent, you might be saved. But they say, what do we have to repent of? Uh, you hear that from Laman and Lemuel, his sons, who seem to be representative of the opinions of the ruling class at Jerusalem, who say, we know that they were a righteous people. People in Jerusalem were good people. Jerusalem's not going to be destroyed. The general setting of Jerusalem in its ancient Near Eastern context was one of great vulnerability. Even though people in Jerusalem tended to be overconfident about their views that God would deliver them again in the, in the future as he had on other occasions in the past. Jeremiah basically said, you're past the point where repentance is gonna do you much good uh, unless it's really drastic. The Lord has forsaken you, and you rely upon the physical temple to protect you, but it's not going to. The Lord is going to let it go. The Lord is going to allow you to be punished. Lehi was called in 597 BC and began to preach in the first year of Zedekiah's reign. People opposed him. Finally, the pressure on him, the threats against his life were so dense, so thick, that the Lord asked him to leave. In the end, Lehi only had one way out. He couldn't go to the north or the east, where Babylon was. To the west lay the Mediterranean. To the southwest was Egypt, and that hadn't worked for the prophet Urijah, who had fled to Egypt before and had been extradited and brought back to Jerusalem and executed for prophesying against Jerusalem, just as Lehi had done. The only way out was to the south, into Arabia. One of the possible routes that Lehi goes uh, takes him down by Arad, where there are still the ruins of a temple. Contrary to what scholars have said for many years, that the only temple, the only place of resort where these offerings were acceptable was in Jerusalem. We now know that there were temples elsewhere. This was a functioning sanctuary in the city of Arad. 
It was first commissioned in the days of Solomon. And in front of me here is the outer courtyard. Behind me is the holy place, and beyond that is the Holy of Holies, which is flanked by two incense altars. Many people have been surprised by the fact that, uh, that Nephi builds a temple in the New World when he gets there, saying that no devout Jew would ever have built a temple outside of Jerusalem. Well, as a matter of fact, uh, devout Jews did build a temple outside of Jerusalem, more than one, and Lehi and his party may well have traveled right past it. One of the important pieces of the Mosaic Law was the fact that one had to be at least three days' journey away from the sanctuary in order to offer a sacrifice. That seems to be the reason why Nephi sticks it into his narrative, making it clear that he and his family had gone far enough away from the sanctuary that his father could offer sacrifice and still be in conformity with the Mosaic Law. When Lehi and Sarai were traveling south, they passed the mines of Timnah. In time, Nephi and other members of their party would have passed this spot no fewer than five times. The mines here at Timnah are among the oldest in the world. We know that the Egyptians operated these mines, the famous pharaohs, Ramses, Seti, uh, Merneptah and others. These mines were operated by the Kingdom of Israel, hence the reference to King Solomon's mines. Those mines had been operating for probably at least a thousand years, maybe more, before Lehi's time. The mines of Timna are very, very important. They indicate that uh, the metallurgical activity, metalworking, was a big deal in ancient Israel, had been for a long time. Undoubtedly, these mines and smelting operations were in full bloom at the time Nephi traveled through this valley. He may very well have stopped here on his travels between the Red Sea and Jerusalem, a journey he made five times. Nephi, living in Jerusalem, would have um, been aware of the different quarters of the city where the craftsmen were, and he may very likely have been apprenticed in metallurgy. It may have been that Nephi was able to study, learn, and work ore, maybe as his assignment within the family. This allowed him, of course, to make metal plates and to write on them. He says, I made the plates that I'm writing on. Therefore, we know he was a metallurgist of, of some ability. There can be no doubt that Nephi was an appreciator of fine metalwork. That was the first thing he noticed about the Liahona, was its fine craftsmanship. He takes the time to tell us what the Sorn of Laban looked like, so he was impressed with beautiful metalwork. And in the midst of slain Laban, he took the time to, like, admire Laban's sword. When he gets to the New World, he sets up making swords, and, and they're using the sword of Laban as their model. If they did have metallurgical connections, that might have dictated the direction they went. It would be a known route. It would be a place they knew about. If you do metalwork, uh, then you probably know the mines of Timna at that period. There's no way I think you can avoid the notion that Nephi had an interest in, a talent for, and worked metal. Some 75 miles south of Aqaba, within three days' walk of the city, there is a valley or a deep canyon which cuts through the granite mountains that run along the Gulf of Aqaba. And in this place, there is a valley whose sides reach to 2,000 feet in elevation above a person. In the bottom of this valley, runs a stream. Those who have been there have gone there at various times of the year and have determined that the stream runs year-round. This place, called Wadi Taib al-Isim, looks like the best, perhaps the only candidate, for the first camp of Lehi and Sarai. When Lehi offered sacrifices at his base camp, it says that he built an altar of stones. That's precisely in accordance with the altar law that we find in Exodus chapter 20. In gratitude and in the spirit of a thank offering, they build an altar 
and offer up sacrifice, showing that the temple understanding was deep in their background. I can't imagine how wonderful it was to have those ritual ways to worship together as a family, to say to the Lord in that way, we are, we are a family and we come before thee in gratitude. That was for them the most eloquent expression of thanksgiving for deliverance and for divine blessing. When we read of this family, the, the ins insularity of it, the just being together in everything they do, it's hard not to be envious. The altar goes all the way back to the beginning of the Pentateuch. The altar is itself a mini temple. And the spirit of somehow acknowledging that our nourishment ultimately is from God, all kinds of nourishment, physical and spiritual, and that to say so in prayer in this mode is to bring a blessing into the act itself. And then the partaking is not just an eating, it is a feast which memorializes the power of God and which is attended by His Spirit. And that is a sacramental act. One of the reasons that Nephi and his brothers go back to get the brass plates is so that they can have a written record. And they know that they can't teach children a language without a written record. Lehi is not only the prophet of this people, he is in residence. He is their patriarch, he is their father, and they gather around, they worship together, they offer sacrifices together, they study the brass plates together. One of the most exciting parts of the Book of Mormon is when the brass plates are delivered to Lehi, he opens them and begins to read. Lehi is in the image of what the brass plates taught them about the ancients and about the chosen family of Abraham. And the role of patriarch for Lehi is the same. And he gets excited when he realizes that he can read his genealogy there. He can read about his fathers there. And of course, that's a record of Josephites because his father ultimately is Joseph. We are to come out of Babylon, which means both confusion and darkness and even idolatry, and not even touch, as it were, the remnants of that. Cut off, literally cut off. That combines with the symbolism of a kind of rebirth, and that's what was happening to the family of Lehi and Sariah. It's impossible not to love this story. For one thing, Nephi begins his record in the very first sentence by putting himself in the context of a family. We women are used to having to put ourselves between the lines of the stories. But in this story, we're right there, more obvious than in many stories in the sacred scriptures. Sariah's named, we see what she's doing, we even hear her words from her own mouth several times. Men had power and women had influence. And so the women um, perhaps were not vocal in public about what they felt and thought. But in private, their husbands paid attention to them. Women's role would have been essential and she would have had to manage somehow to put together food, for example, during that trip. This is not an easy thing. Uh, Nephi might have gone out hunting, but she would have to be prepared to cook whatever he brought back. She would be managing a lot of the domestic uh, details, and there's a great deal to manage. Just providing bread for a family in that time period, um, sorting the grain, cleaning it, parching it, milling it, making the bread, baking it. For a woman around 600 B.C. with about six dependents would have been at least three hours a day just to provide the bread. 
we see a, a constellation of family that is so recognizable from our own lives that we just uh, vibrate to it. In a sense, we're all Lehi's family because we all have tensions in our family and we all have struggles over who's going to be in charge and, and what we're going to do and what the goals of the family are. And we see this reflected quite nicely in the Book of Mormon. It's a real family. We see sibling rivalry. We see tension. Um, and we can imagine what that does to a mother. I think she had the pressure of maybe possibly being a mediary between her visionary husband and her sometimes defiant children. I imagine that the moment Lehi told her about what the Lord had instructed him to do, she anticipated what this would do to her family. The dynamics in the family are really interesting, that, um, that the loyalty of the two oldest sons, Laman and Lemuel, seems to be much more allied with that of the ruling class in Judah than with their own father and they see him as a kind of class traitor. But it's also a, a microcosm of Judea as a whole because within Judea you have different attitudes towards prophecy, the Lord, the scriptures, the temple, all of these different things. When they first leave Jerusalem, they're leaving their inheritance and they, the oldest, Laman, is the birthright son. He's the one that would receive a double portion if he were staying. They weren't convinced it was wise to leave their possessions. They weren't convinced that Jerusalem would be destroyed, and they weren't convinced there was a better place to go. But you also see another characteristic of Middle Eastern families, and that is the loyalty to the father. Laman and Lemuel did not want to go on this journey. Even though there were rebukes, voices, and even angelic appearances, they soon could brush that aside. I think what you see in, in Lehi is a very wealthy person living on the outskirts of Jerusalem who has two older spoiled sons who've grown up quite comfortable in Jerusalem and they are looking forward to the day when they will inherit all that property. And yet they went with their father because of loyalty to the father is absolute in the Middle East. They, they take out their anxiety and their animosity to their father on their brother Nephi. A patriarch cares not just for a large posterity, but like Abraham cares that they be like the stars in merit and worth and blessedness. What they see in their father is he suddenly betrayed their situation. He's become this religious fanatic who's going to take them away from the place that, that is rightfully theirs, deprive them of all the status and the comforts they're used to. Lehi, Nephi says, pleads with Laman and Lemuel quote, with all the feelings of a tender parent. The thing that's heartbreaking to me, and, and women I know who have children like Laman and Lemuel, often take great comfort, great comfort, if they still have a loving relationship with family members. They will say they've left the faith, but they still, we still love one another and we still have a good time together. And there's great comfort in that for the women, but Soraya never even had that. And that breaks my heart for her. Nephi himself, who appears almost flawless, acknowledges in later chapters that he himself suffers with his sense of weakness and even unworthiness. You can't help loving Nephi for his courage and his obedience and his devotion to God. The struggle for fitness and worthiness and divine approval. So even Nephi has his struggles, the dynamic of the inner life. Nephi was another Joseph. I mean, Nephi was unique. Joseph had brothers who hated him. Uh, Nephi had brothers who hated him. And yet his allegiance to God held him to the iron rod that he saw in his father's vision and in his own vision. He held that rod, he never let go of it. The Book of Mormon begins with a family, but more precisely, with a couple, Lehi and Sariah. 
Family dynamics were really interesting in Lehi's family as they traveled along. For instance, um, they are sent back to bring Ishmael and his family back so they would have his daughters to provide wives for Lehi's sons. And marriage is a very, very significant event in a family in this time period. It should bring a smile that Laman and Lemuel murmured, complained about going back at all for the plates. But they were willing to go back for wives. I look at Soraya and I cannot imagine a woman's life turning upside down faster than hers did. I look at this woman who had wealth, who ha must have had a network of extended family, a routine uh, uh, of traditions and uh, friends and whatever, stability in Jerusalem, and then to have it turned up side down within the space of so few, even months. I mean, when they go back to get Ishmael's daughters and suddenly everyone is married, she's got <laughs> in-laws to integrate into her family overnight. When these sons get married, you're bringing in new members of the family and Lehi is going to function as the patriarch of this greater extended family. In Ezekiel 16, God uses the marriage covenant as an analogy for the covenant relationship that he has created between himself and the house of Israel. Looking behind that analogy, we can see certain elements of this sacred marriage covenant as practiced in ancient Israel. It involved an oath and a covenant, a washing with water, anointing with oil, a clothing with embroidered cloth and with uh, linen garments and a crown being placed upon the, the head of the bride. The party of Lehi have shown their fidelity to the Lord's commands. They've now gathered together. The two families have been joined, so they're now ready to become a traveling party who will rely on one another to survive. With the Lord's help, most visible in the Liahona, or this little compass, they set off. Nephi says that they crossed the river Laman in a way, it becomes a symbolic divide. They will never again return to their home in Jerusalem. By the days of Lehi and Sariah, there was already a thriving incense trade. Lehi, when he left Jerusalem, seems to me to be following the reverse incense route. If the premise is correct that Lehi followed the incense route southward along the Red Sea, and had that knowledge of where to go, then he probably acquired that knowledge from either from personal experience or by communicating with merchant communities from South Arabia or other parts of the region. The name Lehi is actually a name that you find in South Arabia. In fact, a number of kings are called Lehi Atar. So there's some clues, I think, in, the, in, in his very name that he may have had some earlier contacts with the area. Lehi would have had to travel on that, but not necessarily exactly the route that everyone else took because there were multiple possibilities within the constraints of the water resources available. It seems to me that Lehi must have had some familiarity with the local culture before in order to make this journey. Along the incense trail, there were oases where there was water. They could not have traveled without water. The desert was full of bleached bones of people who'd failed to find the next watering hole. Um, and so you wanted to go along that trail, but it wasn't clearly marked. You just knew there was a sort of general route you had to follow. Travel in Arabia is intimately linked with water supply. Without water, you are going to die. Therefore, you have to travel along routes where water supplies are available. You need always to have somewhere a well or a small creek where you can get water. It was a matter of life and death. The wells were far apart, and so it would take a particularly robust person or persons to make the journey. As they go, it seems as though they begin along the coast of the Red Sea, but eventually they had to come through the mountains we don't know whether they went through one of the established passes or whether the Liahona led them some other way.
Ideally speaking, each family has its own tent. And when the sons get married, they're given their own tent. The technology of tents of goat's hair was probably exactly the same in the time of Abraham. And of course, during the time of Lehi. Tent living in, in traditional Bedouin societies has been a very uh, kind of stable lifestyle because through trial and error over the centuries, the Bedouins have discovered the best way to do this. The tents that are mentioned so often when Nephi says, and my father dwelt in a tent, were, I would think, very similar to the tents of Bedouin today. The way they made tents was kind of interesting. You would weave, uh, generally camel's hair or sheep's hair, on these, you'd, you'd weave these long panels of, uh, of cloth and then sew them together into tents. So as the travel progressed, the women would be weaving on these small little looms creating these big strips of cloth that could then be bound together, tied up, and, and make new tents. Even though camels, camels aren't mentioned in the Book of Mormon, it's almost certain that, uh, that there were camels along on the trip with them. Camels are actually browsers. So the difference here is that they don't require a lot of grass. They don't require a lot of vegetation growing on the ground. The other unique quality about camels is that they can go long distances between feedings. So they don't have to eat every day. The hump of a camel is mostly composed of fat, not water. That allows them to go long distances without a lot of food. So the idea being, if you arrived at an oasis in the desert, you would spend some time there. You wouldn't hurry away from the oasis. You'd spend some time and you'd fatten up your camels and water them well and rest yourselves for a period of time. And then you would make the jump to the next oasis. Most of the food and water that Lehi needed would probably been, have been obtained uh, through their own efforts. The sons of Lehi enjoyed a lot of success as they traveled in hunting, and mountains would have provided the cover. Along the road, there were a lot of animals, especially ibexes, goats. They will get a lot of sheep. Uh, of course, the, the, the Arabs used to eat camel, camel meat. One of the most daunting landscapes on Earth is that which we find in the interior of Arabia. Lehi and Sariah were dependent on the Lord to bring them through. I believe that it took them about a year to go from their first base camp down to Nahum. The reason is because that's when Nephi mentions the birth of the first children. As I read the text of the Book of Mormon, I suspect that Ishmael was already ill, or had been experiencing ill health, that that was one of the reasons why the family stopped from time to time to rest, sort of gather themselves, gather their strength, and then move on. During the Frankenstein's uh, uh, trade uh, journey, uh, I suppose that quite a number of people will die, because it's, it was a hard journey, definitely. It wasn't an easy journey. And when they die, uh, they will uh, carry it to the nearest place possible. Ishmael makes it this far south, but Ishmael finally, finally passes away. In Yemen, like in many ancient civilizations, they used to respect the dead very much. They would have buried Ishmael here to great mourning. One of the reasons the people felt to mourn is because he was an Israelite, and to be buried away from his home was something of a loss. The areas to bury were known along the Frankenstein's route. I'm sitting in uh, Nehem burial ground that was discovered in 1994. The people who passed through this uh, area and died, they will bring to, to this burial and burial here whether they were uh, uh, Yemenis or foreigners from the north, 
from Mediterranean and from uh, someplace else. They are uh, like small hives or small graves, mounds. And this area where is the uh, burial ground is belong to the tribe of Neh. It's certain that, that this place had a name before they arrived because Nephi very carefully writes the passive, the place which was called Nahum. This is the area of name. Uh, uh, this is the land of name, and also the, the area of the tribe of name. The spelling in 1 Nephi 16 is Nahum, or Nahum, which has something to do with comfort. In ancient South Arabian, the letters NHM have to do with stone cutting and may possibly refer to the kind of work that the people of this tribe did. The name is supposed to be coming from the root Nahama. And Nahama in ancient South Arabian language means to cut stone. We have to imagine what happened when Lehi and Sarai and their party heard this name after the death of Ishmael, that it meant something to them and they preserved it in the text. The Yemenis have excavated a number of cemeteries in that region, including some that contained uh, mummified remains. The mummies uh, that we found here in Yemen uh, were built differently from uh, the ones in Egypt. The knees are not straight like the Egyptian, and, uh, uh, and also they covered all the body inside very nice leathers. The finding of Nehum strikes me as an, uh, just a, a tremendously significant discovery. The gazetteers of Joseph Smith's day listed no such place. What it really is, is a kind of prediction by the Book of Mormon of something that we ought to find. Now the chances of finding that exact name from that exact time in that exact place uh, by random chance are just astronomical. And to find it in the right location at the right time is a really striking bullseye for the book. And there are those who say that the book has no archaeological substantiation. That's a spectacular substantiation right there, it seems to me. Something that would have been unexpected, that it's so unlikely that Joseph Smith could have woven into his story on his own. The Book of Mormon has text, has made a complex prediction, and modern archaeology actually confirms that prediction. It's a direct bullseye, as precise as you could wish it to be. There are inscriptions from the Temple Baran at Marib that date to the 6th century BC that talk about individuals from Nahum. So the region was known at the time of Lehi and was called that at that period of time. The temples that were uncovered there are actually from Lehi's own time frame. But then to find the altars with uh, references to Nahum on them, dating from 600 BC, was just spectacular. Certain ruins or remnants of that temple were uncovered, including three altars, all of which carried this inscription, Nahum. You couldn't have asked for a neater proof that the name was there in the right place at the right time when, when it was supposed to be there for Lehi's group passing through. The witnesses tell us that Joseph didn't even know that the city of Jerusalem had walls around it. Well, if he didn't know that there was a wall around Jer Jerusalem, he certainly didn't know that there was a city or a site out in Yemen called Nahum. The idea that Joseph Smith, for example, was really well versed on, on uh, pre-Islamic Arabian geography or customs in the desert seems to me so ludicrous as to simply be beyond belief. One has to ask the question, how could Joseph Smith possibly have known Nahum? When the Lord asks you to do something, he doesn't give you the whole timetable and the whole plan and the map and the itinerary, and um, it's just one step at a time. When the daughters of Ishmael uh, mourned the death of their father and buried him at Nahum, it was a strange land. If you're disposed to be doubtful, dubious, cynical about this sort of thing, and now you're out there and you're actually paying a price, it's not merely uncomfortable, but, but people are dying. With the death of Ishmael, there would also be a choice in coping, just like with any of the events. 
they could have coped by murmuring and the divisiveness and then the shall we plot to kill somebody and have our way or there could be I'll go to the Lord with my sorrow which is the other way but everybody has a choice and they they made different choices with it and they're asked now to walk away it makes me want to cry from the from their father's grave Sometimes we need to look at it, if we can, from the standpoint of Laman and Lemuel and the children of Ishmael and so on. Uh, it's very easy, sitting comfortably as we do, to say, well, they shouldn't have murmured. Uh, they should have understood. But how would we feel <laughs> being taken away from our comfortable home, let out into the middle of nowhere by a visionary? Uh, and we find ourselves starting to pay this really high price for it. So they mourned, and it would, it would have been a very difficult time for them. And then to leave, to go away from that place, never to return again, would have been very difficult because they were tied by their religious practice to the graves of their ancestors. One of the most intriguing geographical notes that Nephi makes in his narrative of the movement of his family through this part of the world it has to do with the name Nahum, but it also has to do with the eastward turn. It seems as though his note about the eastward turn tells us one that his family is traveling along or shadowing the incense trail and two that he knew about this turn. From the Nahum tribal area eastward the family will run into Marb. That's where they'll come. That's where all the roads are going. And they would come to this grand city. In antiquity, Marb was one of the most important cities in the world. This was one of the most important stops on the fabled incense trail. Marb also became the city of one of the most famous temples known in the ancient world, the so-called Mahram Bilkis, named after the legendary Queen of Sheba. Now, Marib was able to become a major urban center because of its practice of uh, damming and irrigation. Marib Dam is one of the most famous ancient monuments. In fact, some people have thought of it as the eighth wonder of the world. Its verdant character kept the population intact and made this a major stopping center for all of the traffic that came through this part of the world. The question of whether Lehi would have gone through Marib, which would have been a major urban center at that time, is interesting because the account in the Book of Mormon doesn't give that indication. When they were far away from Jerusalem, when they were not afraid of being pursued, they thought they were safe from the political situation in Jerusalem, they wouldn't have felt so wary of having human interactions with people there. In fact, they would have welcomed it. So my bet is that they probably did go into the towns to seek supplies. I would think he would have found it difficult to get through the region without encountering anyone, though, because there's a large population. So I think he would have had to encounter some of the people living there in Marib. What would Lehi and Sarai have found when they came through here? The dam probably wasn't finished by then but it would have been finished enough that this area of Marib would have been a thriving green place, much like in Lehi's dream when he finds himself in the field with a tree. In Joseph Smith's day, uh, very few educated people would have been aware of the civilization that once thrived uh, in northeastern Yemen. It's interesting that we don't find uh, accounts of Lehi interacting with anybody in Arabia. We do, however, find accounts of him uh, knowing names of certain places. That 
implies they interacted with other people that told them what the name of the place was. I think it's very doubtful that Lehi went the entire length of the Frankincense Trail without encountering people. Uh, although he wouldn't have encountered very many. We shouldn't be thinking of it as a fairly densely populated area, but you would have run into some from time to time. It's only toward the end of the trip that he really tries to hide. But he would have been different, and he would have stood out, you know, as a foreigner. It's likely that they avoided contact with people as much as possible uh, for security reasons. You pass through many kingdoms and, and so many states, so many sheikhs. So you have also to pay taxes, you have also to deal with them, you have to sell and, uh, and buy from them. All the Arabians at this time were polytheists. Uh, there was a pantheon of gods, uh, that is to say a, a number of gods that were grouped together in kind of family clusters. Those people used to have their own god called Udu Samawi, the god of heaven. And that god was the god of caravans. There are a great number of differences between their own culture and religious beliefs and the, the local populations. Lehi, I think, would definitely have avoided uh, giving anything that would have been given to another god. That would have been very wrong for him in the Law of Moses. When the family leaves the Marab area, they could go straight eastward, but it's a daunting task to go that far without water. Instead, I believe, they turn southeastward towards Timna. This is the gate of the city of Timna. Here is the temple of uh, Timna, of the people of Timna, and uh, called the temple of the god Am. Timna was the capital city of the Katabanian kingdom. It was a main stopping place for caravans that came from the east. There were laws which governed their entry and they're actually inscribed right here on the sides of the entry to the city. Did Lehi and Sariah and their party pass through this area? In my opinion, yes. I think it's the only place they could have come and, and been able to get water. That's the key thing on this journey. This is Shabwa. Pliny, the elder who lived in the first century AD, said that this city possessed 60 temples. This place flourished because of the incense trade. It was wealthy. People here had a, had a lot of goods. Beautiful buildings arose. Nephi describes that his family turned nearly eastward. And from the tribal area of Nehem, and also from Marib, Shabwa lies in an eastward trajectory across the desert. I fully believe that Lehi and Sarai passed through here. The city would have been a hub of activity. Uh, had they come inside the city, they would have found it full of life. It would have offered them refreshment. Uh, it would have offered them time to sort of gather themselves, gather their strength. It was the last green place before they continued further to the east. As soon as the party leaves Shabwa, they leave safety. They leave security. There was a certain reach of the government of Shabwa, but soon the family is beyond that into uncharted territory. This seems to be the toughest part of that journey. I don't know what the conditions in Jerusalem were to bear children, but they are, must have been significantly better than on the road. Nephi mentions how brave and wonderful the women are, how they're able to give suck to their babies, how they can walk, um, how they're stronger, and how they're not complaining, which is unusual when you think about, here they are entering the worst part of their journey, 
And Nephi pays tribute to these courageous women. When they said our women became strengthened, I thought, thank heavens, they would have been dead. I cannot imagine this kind of a life. These women who are led into the wilderness, already some of them involved in motherhood, Sariah among them, these women had to, first of all, conceive and gestate children in the heat of the desert, but also to carry, both in their arms and inside, children. If you've got a bunch of little children, it simply multiplies the amount of time it takes to do any task, as anybody who's traveled with children knows. Every time Laman and Lemuel do something and we say, oh, these are the bad guys, I think, look at it from their point of view. If they're good husbands, they're, I can see they're feeling protective about these women who are burying their children and suffering, and uh, this is tough. Everything that, that Lehi and his group would have had would have been valuable to a group of people living in a very remote area that was not only slightly lawless, but totally lawless. They would have been going through a region that was entirely tribal, where uh, there was no law, where there was no control by any government or state. These tribes lived in a state, in some ways, of perpetual warfare with one another. It wasn't always open warfare, but it was always ready to break out. And if you don't belong to any tribe at all, you're just an intruder coming through the area, then you may have no allies at all. Nobody may be on your side. And they're also looking at you and thinking, camels, goods, uh, women, whatever it is they want, uh, and you're a relatively small group. This is a very insecure situation to be in. A small group like his may have been subject to uh, being taken captive and becoming slaves. Uh, they were of different religious faith, obviously, than the people that were there, and so they would have been looked upon as foreigners who would have been fair game. The one thing that kept order out there was, was the ability to get vengeance if someone did something to you. But Lehi didn't represent a tribe. There would be no one to avenge his death if anything happened to him, no one to avenge any theft or anything of that kind. He was as vulnerable as could be. He's traveling on his own through this terribly empty place. And at that point, apparently, the determination was, by the Lord, this is just too unsafe to risk drawing anybody's attention. You have to slip through here as unobtrusively as you possibly can. And so they don't even build fires. But what will we have for breakfast this morning? Answer, raw meat. When Nephi is uh, explaining how proud he is of the travelers, particularly the women, he describes how now they're able to eat raw meat. And it's sweet to them, he says. Sweet to them. <laughs> Only God could do that. <laughs> The Liahona becomes their guide. They've left the incense trail, and now they're on their own, going through what is called now the empty quarter. They're going in an area that no one in his right mind would have gone. It's this, this space in the Arabian desert. Out in a wilderness where you can barely survive four or five hours without water. This is the Rubal Khali, the empty quarter. It lives up to its name because of the lack of vegetation in this part of the world. The heat is terrible, we can hardly imagine it. it constantly sapping your strength, dehydrating you, is a truly terrible thing, and the temperatures rise to very, very high levels. You deal with the uh, threat of sands, which, which can kill also anybody or cover anybody under the sand. And when they come, they come very strong. Sandstorms would be terrible. They're not just minor affairs. They can be choking. I can't imagine anything that would be more stressful to deal with as you curled up next to a camel with your cloak over your face and tried to 
wait it out. The reality of an environment that is always there, always hostile, is something that is so hard for the modern reader to appreciate, but constituted the basic reality with which Nephi and his family struggled day after day. Instead of the journey being encouraging in that it gets easier, it gets harder. We often say it's darkest just before the dawn. We sometimes think that some of our greatest blessings come after some of our most difficult trials. This was exactly what happened at the end of this desert journey. That's probably where Nephi's character, Sam, Jacob, Joseph, Lehi, Sariah, that's where they became burnished. This desert crossing was a furnace of afflictions. I think that this was the place which tried the souls of people and proved them whether they were on the Lord's side or not. Some of the members of the family did fine. They swallowed their pride. There are others who couldn't, wouldn't. And for them, this must have been a horrific trial. One cannot blame, in a way, members of the family who came through here and saw nothing but heat sand, flies, scorpions. Yet, for those who would pass it, who would pass the test, God had formed them in his crucible, had shaped them and molded them so that they are ready to begin another people of God. In Joseph Smith's time, the entire educated world, Europe and America, uh, believed that the Arabian Peninsula was just one big desert that went from one sea coast to the other. And for Joseph to describe inland routes of travel, but especially fertile places like the Bountiful that he described, was really quite foreign to what would have been expected and, and extremely dubious. So to find places that look just like that uh, turns out to be really quite remarkable. In this satellite photo of Arabia, one sees one little green band of vegetation. That is the Dofar area of Oman. It lies almost exactly east of the Nahum tribal area. Within that island of greenery on the south coast of Arabia is Bountiful. The Dofar region of southern Oman is unique on the Arabian Peninsula in that it has tropical monsoon forest. A unique feature of this part of Arabia um, are the rains or the mists that come during the summer season. Off the coast of this part of Arabia, there's a fairly cool body of water being pulled up to the surface. The monsoon winds coming across the Indian Ocean pick up a tremendous amount of moisture. So by the time they, they reach the inland, the mainland part, they are very moisture laden and very, very heavy. And consequently, they don't get a lot of altitude. And so they build up along the escarpment or this big bluff that runs along the coast. As it hits the mountains, uh, the mist cannot go up and over the mountains because of hot air blowing from the interior, the Rub al Khali of the desert, outward. So the mists are blockaded and they, they stack up against these escarpments, dropping their moisture load. In contrast to the green of these hills, just a few kilometers to the other side is the interior desert and ultimately the Rub al Khali, the dry desert. It's just absolutely isolated with the desert behind and the ocean on the other side. There is nothing to the east or to the west that compares with it. 
This is truly an island of tropical vegetation in the whole of the Arabian Peninsula. When you look at the southern coast of Oman through that Dofar area, there's a small handful of places that conceivably might have been a bountiful, but only two of those stand out as reasonable possibilities. Uh, on the east end of the Dofar, we have Korori. On the extreme west end of this is Wadi Sake. This is Korori. It takes its name from the bay, which is behind me, called Kor in this part of the world. It's attractive for a number of reasons. For one thing, there's a deep port, as it were, a place where one could build a ship out of the wind, out of the heavy surf of the monsoon season. In my mind, of these two possibilities, the Wadi Sake uh, meets uh, Nephi's bountiful description even better than Korori. A wadi is where a river comes out to the coast through the mountains. When you come down that wadi, that is just desolate. I mean, the rocks stand out much more than any of the plant life. And then just like a line was drawn across the wadi, all of a sudden you have green growth. What they would have seen were uh, green forest carpeting the hillsides, the mountains surrounding the coastal plain. This would have been just an amazing sight to someone that had spent eight years in that uh, empty quarter of the Arabian Peninsula. Coming into a tropical forest, it, it had to have been astonishing to them. Nephi described this area as being bountiful because of its abundant fruit and honey. I saw two different types of species in the grape family growing up over vegetation in that area. This country is rich in both dates and figs, and in the mountaintops there are olives. We have things like wild cucumber and wild melon and other wild gourds that would have been very edible at that point in time. There was a native type of natal plum. There was jasmine growing, wild jasmine, and uh, that was one of my favorite finds. There's a little milkweed pod that grows very commonly within the the Dofar region within the forest that the, the native Jabali relish. And they are very good. They taste like young pea pods. Pistachios would have been the main nut that you would find in that region. Citrus and most likely limes would have been cultivated at the time Nephi was there. So he would have had citrus fruits as well. The species diversity is unreal in that region. So there's a whole variety of, of fruits that would have been present at the time that he would have had easy access to. The cold waters that come to the surface are nutrient rich and supply a wide variety of seafood. In the escarpment mountains up here, there are, uh, in the cliffs, there are cavities in which there are honeybees that nest. The wild bees would build their, uh, their hives uh, often in the face of the cliffs of the escarpment. Based on the vegetation, there appeared to be quite a few things that looked bee pollinated to me. Making honey requires vegetation. Uh, it requires plants that depend upon bees for pollination. There were many of the species that were producing copious amounts of pollen and also copious amounts of nectar. The abundant wildflowers here uh, led to the, a lot of honey being produced. And even today, the natives, the local people will scale down the cliffs uh, with ropes and gather the honey out of the caverns. Nephi's description of Bountiful as being fruitful, as being a land rich in honey, absolutely accurate. Twice in chapter 17, Nephi mentions this mount uh, where he goes to pray. It would be climbable in a couple of hours, uh, but yet is very distinctive as a place uh, to go. Nephi tells us at some length about the difficulties he has with his older brothers. As he says in the text, they tried to kill him by throwing him into the sea. There must be cliffs, rocks with waves dashing in to make this a way to kill someone. Those cliffs are about 200 feet uh, and there is a residential area right at the top of the cliff. So not only uh, do they exist, but they're very handy to a place where people might have been standing while they were arguing.
Battlefield was not the end of the journey. We don't know how soon the Lord came to Nephi, but it's clear that he wanted them to go farther, which now brings Nephi to build the ship. The ships that they, we know that they were using at the time in the region are most likely to have been shallow draft vessels that were used just for uh, going along the coast rather than deep draught vessels that you would use in the uh, open ocean. One of the clearest indicators of shipping along the southern coast of Arabia comes in the form of cave paintings. Because of the writings, uh, ancient writings existed close to the ships and to other paintings, we don't think it is less than 2,500 years old. 2,500 years ago, these things were painted there. We have to remember that in the time of Nephi, that most of the trading was done by sea. We know that the Lord showed Nephi how to build the boat, but he may have had some previous knowledge of boat building by observing boats that were being built along the coast of Israel, or possibly uh, boats that were being used on the Red Sea. So Nephi would have seen the types of ships that they were using there, and uh, obviously he built a different kind of uh, vessel. Now we must recognize that Nephi had some shipbuilding empirical knowledge. He must have seen ships being constructed on his journeys. Nephi's statement is uh, always intrigued me where he said that he did not build his ship after the manner of men. Clearly, he had seen shipbuilding. The ship, as a technological device, was the greatest technology that man could build at this time, or any time throughout man's history. What a feat it was for him to actually undertake this. When Nephi was commanded to build a ship, he had only one question. He asked the Lord where to find ore with which to build tools to make the ship. There are no sizable deposits of any metals in the Dofar region of uh, Oman. There's no documented occurrences of copper or any kind of ore in, in southern Arabia along, along the coast. So he definitely would need divine guidance in terms of, well, where do I go? There's really only two places along this coast, this large area here, and another small one uh, near uh, Wadi Sake, where there is uh, really any iron ore at all. It seems to me that, that he knew what to do with the ore once he found it. We have veins of iron ore coming up through the metamorphic rock right to the surface of the ground. And so collecting it would have been no problem at all. The unique thing about this deposit is that it's come from so deep and it's very well exposed on the surface. What makes it unique is that there is very soft pulverant limonite, which is iron with a little bit of water in the structure, and then there's also iron carbonate. Uh, this is remarkable because by having those two things occur in the same rock, you have an iron ore that is much more easily smelted. Near the surface, that iron carbonate will break down or weather to form iron oxide. And iron oxide is the, is the desirable ore. I have never seen any ore, any iron ore like this, uh, any place in the world. To me, the Lord did everything possible to make this easy to use. This was the ideal mixture for a layman. You just have to go dig it up with your hands, and uh, it's ready to go. The iron ore is highly concentrated. And so not only would it have been easy for him to see and collect, it would have been easy for him to make a tool from these raw materials. You could collect enough iron ore in a matter of a few minutes to make all the tools you would want. The shaping of the uh, iron into, uh, into the actual tools would simply involve a process of uh, heating and uh, reheating and uh, pounding with a hammer until you got the shape you wanted. Once he reached the New World, he talks about various kinds of metals that they worked and that they were there in abundance. So Nephi was definitely interested in geology, finding metals, metallurgy, making things. Uh, I think he must have been very skilled. The blacksmiths of the early West did exactly what Nephi did. The fact that in Bountiful there are these two ore deposits is amazing to me. And the fact that Joseph Smith had no way of knowing that. The 
question naturally arises about timbers for an ocean-going vessel. They have to be tough, they have to be strong. Nephi does say in his narrative, after he mentions timbers, he does say, we went forth. So it leads me to believe that they actually went up into the forests surrounding woods, and that's where they selected their woods to use in the, in the ships. In this region, however, there is a unique group of trees that are often referred to as umbrella trees that grow quite tall with a straight trunk and have long been known as a source of timber for the local people. There's lots of different kinds of acacia that grow there and it's a very, very strong wood and it would have made excellent wood for, for the ribs. The forest itself is not terribly tall. Most of the trees stay fairly short, but other trees such as Boscia or Lania or other trees such as that would have potentially provided fairly sizable timbers. The timbers then necessary to work the rest of the ship would have been readily available to him in the mountains and forests of the Dofar region. We know more about what Nephi's ship was not than we do of what it was because of this phrase, not after the manner of men. What does that mean? Does that mean that the ships that were built in Egypt, the ships that were built in Greece, the ships that were built in, in Arabia were not going to be copied? There's a clear indicator in the language of chapter 17 of 1st Nephi that Nephi received a vision of his boat, of his ship. Naturally, Nephi has the advantage of the Lord's instruction, certainly in overall design, maybe even in building techniques. What finally took Columbus's ships across the Atlantic was a deep, tall hull. The deep, tall hull had to be built skeleton first. This was not done regularly at the time of Nephi. Is this what Nephi means when he says that he had not built it after the manner of men? The manner of men were building the hull first and then adding the skeleton. Building the skeleton first would have meant that Nephi's ship could have been taller and also deeper into the water. That Nephi, in fact, turned it around and built the skeleton first and then added the hull. This, in fact, would be the innovation. All of the ships that we see in the region uh, during this period have either a single or dual rudder systems that run down the side of the ship near to the stern. The rudder was of huge importance while sailing over open seas because it was the rudder that would be used to tack the vessel to pick up wind or in fact to get the vessel out of danger if a squall was to come up all of a sudden. If you did not have good efficient rudders the ship would founder. When we look at Nephi's ship, he must have had the dual rudder system. A single rudder would not have been able to control a vessel on the open ocean. Nephi mentions nothing about the sails themselves. He does tell us that he sailed the vessel, but he mentions nothing about these sails. So probably they were not different. They did not have either the curious workmanship or the difference that he prescribes to the vessel itself. Nephi's vessel must have had a large rectangular sail. There's a small dwarf palm that grows here in these mountains. It makes a very fine, excellent cordage. One of the unique features of that particular type of rope is that unlike other ropes which degrade when exposed to water, the dwarf palm rope actually strengthens and toughens when exposed to water. Book of Mormon scholars have often talked about how large this ship had to be. Space is a modern luxury. We know that pre-modern peoples did not have the concerns about space that we do. We focus on the idea of time, of speed, of space, uh, luxuries, in fact, to pre-modern peoples. Pre-modern technology was much more utilitarian. And so the notion that you needed to have a large amount of space for a family or a person was simply not the case. I feel that the Nephi ship need not have been longer than 35 or 40 feet. How long might it have taken? Minimum two to three years. We know that Nephi never doubted when the Lord came down and told him to build a, a naval vessel of this sort. We know, however, that his brothers were full of doubt. Certainly, they recognized that Nephi was not a trained shipbuilder. At the end of the project, everyone was impressed including and especially 
those who resisted helping Nephi early on. We do know that at the end, that Laman looks at the vessel and goes, wow, that's pretty awesome. You've done a pretty good job. And for a compliment from his brother, that would, must have been a pretty impressive vessel. It's an interesting transition to see that transition from Lehi the prophet to Nephi the prophet because it seems very smooth. We don't see him turning over anything. We don't see any formal exchange. Nephi's own wonderful personality makes it possible for him to take the laughter of his brothers and the derision of his brothers. You build a ship, what do you mean? Uh, and and just moves through, just does what needs to be done. Nephi is almost unreal. You cannot even imagine time after time. Every time he meets anything, he just blossoms before us. He just, um, he's almost miraculous in the way he meets challenges. On the ship, when his brothers tie him up and threaten to kill him, uh, his faith is like a light. I mean, he, it's, it cuts through all the darkness of his brothers. And he's so loving, he is so kind, he's so forgiving. He's the Joseph kind of example. And being a son of Joseph, that makes perfectly good sense. There is not one instance in any of their interactions where they are not pointing everyone toward the Lord. That Nephi is not asking them to follow him. He's asking them to follow God. Lehi is not asking them to follow Nephi. He's asking them to follow God. After we get over the simple awe that anyone has that Nephi could have built such a technological device with such limited knowledge, then we have to make him the captain of the ship. We have to actually say, okay, Nephi, now you have to sail the ship. You have to be the captain. No one else on there knew how to sail it. Nephi did. Nephi's bravery is something else. His knowledge of this becomes something significant and no doubt divinely inspired. When they left uh, the Arabian Peninsula, uh, the land of Bountiful, if they followed the course that later uh, Arab sailors followed, they would have gone virtually straight east across the Indian Ocean. And that required that it was during the season of the monsoon, when winds are from the south, but veering over toward Indian Peninsula. Nephi, no doubt, kept close to shore when he could. This was not something that was just tradition among shippers. This was used for safety and also used for resupply purposes. You come to a strait around Sri Lanka. Then you go in the eastern part of the Indian Ocean over to uh, the Thailand and Malaysian Peninsula. The biggest problem they would have faced in the oceanic journey was probably water supply. Did they stop on the way? Surely. Uh, why go without water when you can go ashore and get it, and also give the kids a run on the sand. They may well have fished, of course. You'd expect them to fish on the way. Uh, fish is a very nourishing food and a lot of water in it. They might get some water from tropical storms, but that would be unreliable. Ships did not move fast. They didn't need to move fast, but they didn't need to resupply. Speed and time are modern concepts. Again, Nephi didn't need to hurry. He wasn't being pressured to do this. The voyage could have taken quite a long time. The distance is long, and it's made even longer by going along the coastline and not in a straight line. But the necessity for speed was simply not there. The place where the westerly winds caused by El Nino would go, would be south of the equator, uh, 
at least mostly. Hawaii is too far north. Fiji, a possibility. New Caledonia, a good possibility to the south of Fiji. And over to southern Polynesia, the Cook Islands, Tahiti, or some of the associated islands. Those are likely. And then he has to make the jump to the New World. And that would have been the most frightening part. That's when the bravery, and that's when the seamanship comes in. There's no island to seek refuge. view is that they landed on the coast of Guatemala, possibly El Salvador, but I can't come any closer than that. establish themselves, live the law of Moses much better than the people in the Old Testament ever figured out to do it after they left, and welcome the Savior of the world. All who have the Book of Mormon owe an incredible debt to Lehi, Sariah, and their posterity. Their history becomes a tool in our lives to get through our wilderness to find our way back to the tree of life that Lehi saw. We all live with a mixture of joy and sorrow. That's what this world is all about, and that's why this tale is in some ways um, a tale of all of our lives, all of our journey on this earth, that there is opposition in all things, but we're not to be overwhelmed by the sorrow. There is joy. There's inspiration for us in that, I think, too, that um, that you have to believe what the Lord says, you have to believe His promises, you have to act on them. And then the result of that is tremendously great blessings. The spiritual message of the Book of Mormon, of course, overrides and undergirds everything else. That is its central point, and it comes to sharp focus on the risen Christ. For He is the one who is the driving force behind the entire record. How a young boy a young man like Joseph Smith could ever have painted a picture as rich as this family and their journey. It's just impossible. This came from the Lord. The last testimony he bore on this earth was in Carthage jail to the guards. And what did he bear testimony of? The Book of Mormon. 